So good morning to everyone officially who's joining us online. It's great seeing all the names as usual and the regulars. We really appreciate the ongoing support through the iTuesdays. And today we've got Sherwin and John with us. Um, John is a gentleman who has joined me with his camera on. So thank you, John. And um, John is the CEO elect of the South African Institute of Race Relations. So John, I'm sure you will give us a bit more of insight into what that pertains to and what, you know, how you guys fit into the picture. But John's just going to speak to us a bit about you know, COVID and how, it's, how it affects us and our economy and as well as the recent unrest that we've all experienced. So um, with no further ado, John, I'm going to hand over to you. If you're happy, we will deal with all the questions afterwards. Please feel free to pop your questions into the chat box. For those that are on Teams, also just pop your questions into the chat box on Teams and our team will make sure that we bring it over to Zoom and we deal with all the questions. And yes, please, once um, the formal part's over and we onto the questions and answers, please feel free to unmute yourselves and engage with, with John and ourselves and Sherwin. And um, we'll be more than happy to do that. So then John, I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Super, thank you very much for inviting us. I'm um, really glad to be here with you um, and to be able to speak to you about some of our analysis of the country. Um, and I'm going to give, well, I'm going to share my screen first, as a matter of fact. I'm going to check that you are able to see it. So would you mind confirming, are you able to see the a screen that yes. says the high tide of revolution? Yes, we are. Dramatic so pictures. Good, so you'll see that the, the branding on the slide says CRA, Center for Risk Analysis. And the background to this is that the Institute of Race Relations was founded over 90 years ago and built a very strong reputation for its work on data research um, and quantitative research. So we've got a very long history of um, finding important stats about South Africa, analyzing and interpreting them um, and trying to figure out what is going on in the country. And this tradition is what we parlayed into the Center for Risk Analysis which is a brand that is really aimed at the business community uh, and, and uh, aims to give our clients across you know, uh, banking institutions, uh, insurance, uh, mining companies, embassies, uh, government institutions, uh, some insight into the state of the country. And given the events of mid-July, uh, those dramatic events, obviously this is something we wanted to talk about uh, and to understand and help you understand what, what was going on there. So we call this presentation uh, with, with high drama, the high tide of revolution. Uh, and you'll see the, the president Ramaphosa in the foreground, some flames in the background and the shadowy figure. Um, you might be able to recognize the outline of former president Zuma there. And of course, these are all the things that came into this combustible mix of conditions that led to the um, explosion one can say in July. Just gonna bring up my little laser pointer. And then as we go through the presentation, we'll be able to follow it and uh, see what we are talking about. Um, I've got 10, 10 sections to this presentation. It'll take us about half an hour or so. You'll see that we do quite a lot of data. Uh, so I'm going to move through it quite fast. But the overarching argument we are making for you today is that the events of July we're really, in a sense, predictable given the trajectory that the country has been on for quite a long time. If you look at the economic data and the socioeconomic data, and also the protests that have been a feature of life in South Africa for a number of years now. So we'll talk to you about the protest uh, uh, data first. We'll take you through the link to politics, to employment, uh, some more economic data, the social welfare, and finally also the ANC and the, the uh, fiscal budget deficit that South Africa has at the moment. So let's get right into it. The first chart I'm showing you here is called the number of violent protests in South Africa between 1997 and 2019. And you'll see that along the bottom axis, it goes along the years. And the left-hand axis shows us the number of incidents that were counted by the police for each of these years. And these police statistics, um, I think the closer you look at them, they get a bit fuzzy around the edges because what counts, what doesn't count as a protest, there's some definitional issues around that and also some reporting questions. But we think that the trend that they paint is overall accurate. And if you look at the trend line, this is what you see. 
You see that uh, protests for most of the first decade of democracy or decade and a half of democracy were simmering along at a level of between 500 and 1,000, and then really started taking off around 2008, 2009, uh, and have continued climbing through this entire time up to the present. And the unrest that we saw in KZN in July and in Gauteng, we think is uh, very much in keeping with the trend that is displayed on this graph. In terms of our history, you'll know that uh, something very important happened in the year 2007. Uh, well, two very important things, actually. The one is the global financial crisis, and the other is the election of uh, President Joker, Jacob Zuma to power. And we think that these things are linked. They had a significant impact on the economic development of the country and on the state of unrest in the country. And that is reflected in these charts. So the former, the previous chart showed us the total number of uh, incidents that were counted each year. But those incidents in police reporting are also split up into uh, all protests and then the share of those protests that were violent. In other words, that required police action uh, to, to subdue them or to intervene. And that number has also been increasing as this chart shows. It's the same years along the bottom axis from 1997 to 2019. And then along the left-hand axis, it shows us the share of uh, protests that were violent. Again, those numbers stayed more or less constant for the first decade, decade and a half of democracy, and then took off quite steeply. And in 2019, we reached a level where almost a third of all protests were violent, requiring police intervention. Um, and this is a reflection, we think, of a growing dissatisfaction of the people of South Africa with the state of the economy, the state of the country, and the state of the politics. So if we link that into the politics, um, we shall see that uh, we can link it, for example, to ANZ voter support. In this case, we've got two left-hand axes. We're looking at the time period from 1994, the dawn of democracy right through to 2020. And we can look at ANC voter support, which is mapped on the left-hand axis, and the number of violent protests on the right-hand axis. You see that ANC support increased, and this is actually a, a rather remarkable thing, because of course in 1994, the presidential candidate was none other than Nelson Mandela. But the ANC managed to increase its support in the subsequent two elections, reaching a level of almost 70% in 2004 before then um, starting its decline. Now, as that was happening at the same time, the number of protests increased in South Africa. And this is an expression of the dissatisfaction with the performance, we think, of the, um, the ANC, and also a reflection on the crisis of rising expectations. Because what happened during the first decade was that uh, on many counts, South Africa actually performed quite well, as we will see on later charts. Um, and this uh, led people to believe that their lives could continue improving. And when, when those improvements stopped occurring, um, it created quite a sense of dissatisfaction and unhappiness that found its expression in protests. Again, we can overlay the share of protests that were violent as opposed to just looking at all protests. And we see the same relationship holds um, as the ANC support levels start dropping from about 2004 to, through the Zuma presidency going down, the number of violent protests started increasing. I alluded earlier to the economic factors driving this. Um, a useful number to look at here is, of course, employment. So we see here um, a chart with two axes once again on the left hand side, the number of people with jobs in South Africa. On the right hand side, the number of violent protests. And again, we're looking at the period 1994, the dawn of democracy, all the way through to um, the first quarter of 2021 in this case. So this is the employment um, graph. And something very important happened between 1994 and about you know, 2007, 2008, which is that the number of people with jobs almost doubled from 8 million um, at the beginning to over 14 million, close to 15 million at the end of this period. And this was uh, a very important policy success of the ANC that um, it often doesn't get enough credit for. But that period really did create jobs. 
If we look at the period after that, we see that the rate of increase in the number of jobs declined. Um, so it, the number of people with jobs grew more slowly. And many of those jobs that were added during this period were public sector jobs. Um, but the economy itself wasn't really creating jobs at the pace that was necessary. We didn't see another doubling in the number of people with jobs between, say, 2007 and 2020. Uh, last year, of course, COVID hit. And what we saw there was uh, a huge drop in the number of people with jobs. Um, about one and a half million jobs were lost. And it brought us to a situation, uh, even if you look at 2021 now, where the number of people with jobs is equivalent to the number who were uh, in employment in 2008 when President Mbeki left office. And this is really a dismal underperformance, not having been able to increase this number. We think that if this number of people with jobs had doubled again, um, since 2008, the country would be in a much different situation. Um, there would be less unrest um, and more social cohesion, to use a catchphrase much in vogue with the government. But that didn't happen. Uh, we stagnated uh, and, and, and dropped and really didn't make any progress over uh, the period of, of 12, 13 years. And uh, as you would have come to expect by now, this is mirrored in the protests. Um, once again, while jobs were being created and people found employment, protests stayed relatively low. Then as job creation slowed and moved into the public sector, uh, the number of protests increased. This is the same chart, just showing the number of um, people with jobs as before, but also showing the share that were, pro um, that were violent, the share of protests that were violent. And this is, I think, easy to understand um, in the sense that you know, having a, a job, I think, is something that uh, gives you a sense of uh, dignity, self-worth. Um, it gives you income. It lets you provide for, for your family. And when you can't get that and you see that there's no prospect, prospect of getting that, it does create a, a huge sense of disempowerment and frustration, which finds its expression in uh, protests in the street. We can link these figures to incomes as well. Um, so the, the number we're looking at here is real GDP per head, which is inflation adjusted, adjusted for the period 1994 to 2020. And this is simply uh, the GDP that is the value of all the goods and, and services produced in the country during a year, divided by the number of people. And this mirrors what we saw on the jobs chart in the sense that the first decade and a half of democracy saw a rapid increase in um, average wealth in the country up to 2008, 2009. But then we see um, first a dip, then slow growth, but it effectively translates into stagnation. Um, and South Africans have effectively become poorer over the past decade, especially if you look at this in dollar terms. So even in RAND terms, there hasn't really been growth in, in uh, personal uh, wealth or prosperity. It has stagnated. People haven't seen their lives getting better. And that has led to frustration and unhappiness, which found its expression in the protests. Um, it is reflected again in the violent protests as well. Um, people were not, uh, South Africans were not seeing themselves getting wealthier. Instead, they were seeing that their lives were staying the same in the best case, maybe getting worse, and that then found its expression in the protests. So this is um, a chart that shows how we've done compared to the rest of the world. Um, this is GDP per capita for South Africa and, and the world. And you'll see that for the first uh, decade and a half of democracy, South Africa's GDP per capita development tracked that of the world pretty closely. So even though we were below the average, that distance didn't increase. But after 2008, um, and this dip here, this gap started widening. And this is an indication that South Africa's economy underperformed compared to the rest of the world. And uh, we were really falling behind in terms of our GDP per head. It's a very important statistic is a real gross fixed capital formation, which is a, a, a mouthful. But what it describes is the um, 
the willingness of firms to sink money into things like factories, machinery, equipment, um, real assets that can produce value. And this is a volatile indicator, therefore it must be read with a bit of caution, but it gives us uh, an indication of trust in the econ economy and in the future of the country. You know, what do investors who have to risk their own money think about the prospects? Uh, once again, we see that during the first decade and a half, um, trust in South Africa was increasing. It went down here uh, during the uh, Asian crisis and the dot-com uh, um, bust, but then increased quite quickly between 2001 uh, through to 2007, 2008. Uh, the fixed capital, so plants, equipment, machinery, factories, are the things that produce value in an economy. So they are a very important measure of where the economy is going um, and what we've seen, unfortunately, over the decade since 2008, is that as a share of GDP, uh, fixed capital formation has declined, has, has gone down. And this is a, a number we like to look at and we like to tell our clients to keep looking at this because if we see South Africa's fortunes turn around, this is going to be one of the first indicators that's going to turn. Um, as the country's prospects start to be perceived differently by investors, both local and uh, foreign, we will see the gross fixed capital formation number start to climb. But at the moment, we're not seeing that. Um, and that makes us think that economic growth is not a strong prospect on the horizon at the moment. Um, that would require some quite fundamental shifts in the way the country is run. Um, once again, we see that the, the protests uh, mirror the progress the country is making in econ economic terms. So as long as there is progress, protests stay low. When progress stops and stagnation occurs, protests go up. So another thing we can look at is, of course, that South Africa has built quite a large uh, welfare state, um, probably the largest welfare state amongst emerging markets in the world. How does that relate to violent protests? Well, um, on the left hand side, we see the number of social grants that the state pays out. On the right hand side, we see the number of violent protests per year, and this covers the period 1996 through to 2020. What we see during the first decade is that the social grants get rolled out quite quickly, and the social network covers more and more people. But this rate of growth slows down um, after 2008. This uh, red line doesn't climb as fast anymore. And what also happened is that the value of the social grants was eroded by inflation and didn't ke uh, keep pace with inflation. So social grant recipients also felt that they were uh, finding it harder and harder to make ends meet, which is another driver of the unhappiness and dissatisfaction that uh, we saw expressed in July. Uh, these lines mirror each other, so the, share, uh, the, the number of protests increased, but so did the share of violent protests as well. Right. Um, I made the point earlier that the South African government was very successful in its um, rollout of services, especially during the first decade and a half. Um, what this statistic shows us is the proportion of households in formal dwellings linked to the number of violent protests. Um, again, we see sort of between 2004, 2010, a very strong increase in the number of uh, people who uh, live in formal houses rather than in informal housing um, as, as like shacks, for example. And that rate of increase then starts slowing down, especially during the, the latter half of the 2010s. And that is the same time during which the protests increased in scale and also in intensity. We can also look at the portion of households using electricity for cooking. Um, this is another indicator of um, the rollout of service delivery. Again, we see a very a high level of increase uh, in the first decade and a half of democracy. Now I see that this chart only starts in 2002, uh, but we see the rate slowing down. Um, and of course, we also started getting load shedding from about 2007, 2008. 
um, and the state is not, not quite as uh, capable as providing services as it was during that first decade and a half. Again, that is reflected both in the number of protests and also in the intensity of protests. So this brings us to the question of ANC support more broadly. Um, in this chart, we show the number of people with jobs along the left-hand axis. Uh, you've seen this outline before, the cityscape, and we relate that to ANC support. And uh, as, as, we, as I mentioned previously, you see that ANC support rose while jobs were being created, and it started declining as the rate of job creation slowed down. Right, so where do, where's the ANC heading? Um, that is the question on everybody's minds at the moment. Uh, and the important number in this is the 50% level. So the ANC in 2019 uh, got 57.5% in the elections, which sort of seems quite, quite a comfortable distance away from 50. But um, polling seems to suggest that that number is dropping quite perilously. And we think that the ruling party is aware of this. Uh, we show here the polling, uh, some polling data from the time of the national election. So that was Ipsos in November 2019. Uh, they polled the ANC at 55 and the ANC actually got 57.5. So that's pretty close, well within the margin of error. But a year later in September 2020, Ipsos was polling the ANC at 50%. And our own polling put the ANC just below 50%. Um, the polling data for the DA and EFF, the DA data is usually out quite a bit um, for methodological reasons. EFF data is probably roughly accurate, um, but what we're really tracking here at the moment is this drop in ANC support, and we think that there is a prospect that the ANC is going to lose an election. Uh, before long, uh, the current moves to postpone the local government elections uh, are being justified with COVID-related arguments, but we think there might also be a desire on the part of the ruling party to give itself a bit more time to uh, uh, reverse what, is, what it is seeing in the polling data uh, and maybe give itself a better chance of still sticking about 50%. We also polled uh, ANC support by age group, and the magic 50% line is here. And you could say, well, you can see that the strongest support for the ANC is the 50 plus age bracket at 54%. Um, but that is a voter group that is slowly moving towards the end of its life expectancy, whereas the younger voter groups that are going to decide future elections that is sort of from the people will be 18, 19 years old at the next national government elections through to the ones uh, who are on their, their parenting and, and career building phases is uh, at 50 or quite significantly below 50 at the moment. So there is a prospect of the ANC losing an election and this creates a sense of um, distress and uh, uh, feeling threatened within the party, which Stokes uh, factional fighting and, and competition for resources. Uh, and that I think explains part of the unrest that happened in July, uh, which was attributed or has been called an insurrection and attributed to supporters of former President Zuma um, stoking unrest. That is true to an extent, but we think that uh, mainly it was the, the socioeconomic conditions that were just provided very fertile ground for conflagration to erupt um, and that the inflammatory statements made on social media, for example, were merely the spark that ignited the tinder. At the same time as all of this is going on, the South African state is in a bit of trouble, um, as I'm sure you're, you're all aware. And we wanted to see how big <laughs> that hole was that we find ourselves in at the moment. This chart shows you the budget deficit. So that's uh, the difference between how much the government collects in a given year and spends in a given year. Uh, and we had to go back all the way to 1913 to find comparable levels of budget deficit to what we're seeing at the moment. 
So this is the historical chart. Um, you see that we had an absolutely insane budget deficit of 14% uh, last year. Um, the finance minister projecting to stabilize that and, and bring it back closer to the historical average of about 4%. Um, but these levels here are really quite something exceptional. And they were matched only three times in South Africa's past. That was in the mid 80s when uh, apartheid was in its death throes. Um, it, the state had run out of money. Um, the uh, American Chase Manhattan Bank, I think 1985, decided not to extend any further credit. And really, it was the end of the road for that government. If you're looking for comparable levels of budget deficit before that, you have to go back all the way to the first, to the Second World War and the First World War. And as a student of history, you'll see that there were changes of government around those times. Um, so in 1924, I think the Smuts government um, lost, lost an election. So that started a, a political change in South Africa. Um, in 1948, the National Party got elected into power and introduced apartheid as a formal policy. That was after significant budget deficits. In the 1980s, of course, uh, the budget deficits heralded the transition from apartheid to uh, the democratic South Africa. And the question is now, what should we expect from this budget deficit that we're looking at at the moment? That is going to be a question that should exercise all of us. Um, at the same time as the budget deficit is increasing, of course, the state has to take on more debt in order to fund its spending. And we see debt levels here at the sort of in the 2021 to 2023 projection hitting very high levels, approaching 90%. And we think that this might still be a little bit optimistic um, on the part of the finance minister, mainly because there is no, there are no proper reform prospects in the offing. And as a result, we don't think there are growth prospects. And without growth, it will be very difficult to get this budget deficit and the debt under control. But before I move on from this chart, I'd just like to point out something really special, which is that the ANC administration, which came in in 1994, inherited um, a heavy debt burden approaching 50% around 1996. But through prudent macroeconomic policies managed to bring that down at almost half the debt burden through to 2007, 2008, and brought it to a very manageable level of around 25%. And during these three years, 2005, 6, 7, uh, the government actually posted a budget surplus, which is a historical rarity. Um, very few governments managed to do that. And that really was a very impressive achievement by the government for which we think that the administration of that time doesn't receive enough credit. So that era was one that, um, despite its weaknesses, performed very strongly on a number of counts and might also give some inspiration to the administrations that might succeed the current Ramaphosa administration. Uh, we've shown before that we are able to get deficits and debt under control in South Africa. Um, and what we need to do is replicate the policies that allowed us to do that if we want to repeat the feat. Right, so there's been a lot of public debate around whether what happened in July was an attempted coup or was it riots or was it an insurrection? Um, I think that debate is still going to go on for a while. So we created a little uh, table, a breakdown, showing the difference between these kinds of events. And uh, you'll see that political organization is uh, always a requirement for a coup or insurrection. Um, and for protests and riots, it is usually a requirement, but not always. In South Africa in July, there was uh, an aspect of that in terms of the supporters of Jacob Zuma um, calling for uh, making the place ungovernable, and protesting and burning and uh, causing general mayhem. Um, in terms of public incitement to break the law, that is something that is, can be present in protests and riots. It was present here. It was not a predominant feature. Uh, it's not a predominant feature of um, coups and insurrections, but it was present here. Uh, for coups and insurrections, you definitely need meetings and planning. In this case, 
there was an element of that um, around. Was there violence directed at, at specific uh, groups, companies, or communities? Um, yes, it, it was a present feature, and it's also a common feature of both protests and coups or insurrections. Um, then we get to the points where there is less of an overlap between, say, a protest and a coup, like, for example, the looting of goods of value. Um, so that certainly is was a very marked feature of what we saw in July. And usually in, in uh, these kinds of protests, if they are uncoordinated, you do get people taking, uh, seeing an opportunity, taking the gap and making use of that opportunity uh, to take goods of value. That usually is not really a feature of coups though, um, because usually coup plotters do want to uh, maintain control of the situation. They don't want it to get out of control because then they wouldn't be able to exercise power once they have gained the upper hand. But in this case, certainly looting was very prominent. Then when it comes to infrastructure, of course, if you're planning a coup, you know that's, that's going to be your target. You're going to focus on the airports, the power, the communications, uh, the offices of government. Um, if, you, if it's protests or riots, there'll be some damage to infrastructure, but it will not really be a targeted um, sabotage or targeted intervention. And indeed in July, we saw some damage, but um, not enough really to justify, I think, the argument that that was a coordinated effort. Attacks on security forces, um, well, in a coup, you know, that is always the question where, where does the loyalty of the army lie with the security forces? If it is divided, then you, you will see some sort of armed conflict between uh, various branches of the security forces. That is not something we saw in July. You might get these uh, isolated incidental attacks. We saw a bit of that. Um, armaments of war, so heavy heavy guns, for example, you would see in a coup, you'd see tanks in the streets. Didn't really see that in July. Um, in terms of participants, in protests and riots, you see many people out on the street, but you usually don't really see um, them taking sides. So it will be everyone for themselves, uh, large groups of people moving around. Um, but in this case, we didn't really see these clearly delineated combatants. And finally, the last point we have here is the political objective ideology. It can be a feature of a protest or riot. Um, for a coup, it certainly is. You'll see some sort of uh, big idea behind it, but that wasn't a feature in July. So our um, take on the balance of probability is that we were dealing more with something like protests and riots than something like a coup and insurrection. However, for the government, it is valuable to present it as an insurrection because it gives it um, uh, an excuse for having underperformed on the socioeconomic conditions that provoked the protests and riots and gives it um, something to point a finger at in the justification of what happened. Good. Um, let me just see if I can scroll to my next slide. There we go. Okay. So where does this lead to? Um, we think that there are possibly two, two paradigm shifts that you might want to prepare for mentally. The one is the breakup of the union and an enclave future. Um, so here the scenario is that uh, the state is not able to assert itself any longer in terms of the rule of law, in terms of the mon monopoly on violence. And I think this is what many South Africans saw in, in KZN, in July and in Gauteng. The state was effectively absent um, and people defended their own property using their own means, um, which uh, presages a kind of enclave future where um, communities do things for themselves. It may go to an extent where you'll see uh, things that remind you of the great walled cities of the medieval ages in Europe. You'll see citadels, you'll see enclaves, um, and South Africa will turn into quite a strange country of various enclaves, uh, you know, uh, arranging their own affairs on their own behalf with or without the permission of the central government, which won't be able to enforce um, unity in the state anymore and will be forced to accept the new status quo. Uh, the other path that we might take is the defeat of the ANC um, and a new authority in Pretoria. Um, the polling seems to indicate that the defeat for the ANC is on the cards, 
the shape of the country once that happens um, really becomes a question then of, of what replaces the ANC. And we have some thoughts on that, which I think we'll share in the Q&A. But let me thank you there. Let me stop here. Thank you very much for your attention and invite your questions. Thanks, John. That was very insightful. And um, just the level of detail with regards to the information and stats that you've put up, put out to us in a more simply viewing perspective is really interesting. And um, it's interesting to see how you know our presidential how that changes, how the graphs also change and how that's had a big influence. We don't always you know, if we look back, we don't always realize it, but when we look at it from that perspective, it really makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. And then um, there was a question around the slides. We will make the slide deck available. So we will send that and distribute it to the attendees. So please, um, please be aware of that. And then you guys can have some interesting discussion of your next Zoom BRI meeting. Um, so that'd be nice. And then John, we had a question from Claude Hamann around um, the slides, which we gave feedback on. And then the second question he had was, given the 2021 events, what does the trend look like for SA in the next five years? Are we following the Zim road or does SA have enough policy and rule of law to become a dominant African leader? We think South Africa still has the potential to come right. And the reason we say that is uh, there are three things that need to happen for South Africa to, to get onto a better track. Um, the first is that the ANC needs to lose an election um, because we don't think that there's salvation for South Africa through the ANC. Um, the party doesn't really have the, uh, the ideas, the resources, the energy to fight these battles and to, to create the reforms that would allow it to stay in power. So we think that the ANC an ANC defeat is going to come. Secondly, we look at our polling and at the attitudes and opinions of ordinary South Africans. And we see that there's a very large group of South Africans who are disengaged from the political process. Um, so we see that the non-voters are increasing, people are staying away from elections. And many of these people are staying away because they don't see uh, political choices that appeal to them. But in terms of values, they are very much middle of the road, um, decent people who are interested in really fundamental things like um, having a safe environment, having a job, um, having good housing, uh, being able to educate their children properly and so on, which are not, you know, highfalutin revolutionary ideals. These are very, you know, basic common sense desires. And these are the South Africans who don't quite buy into what they're being served at the moment in the political market. There seems to be a vacuum there for something new to emerge that is able to address these requirements. And we think that if this sort of very reliable, solid, middle of the road class of South Africans sticks around, which we think it will, and South Africa remains a free society, then there will have to emerge a party that will cater to that, to that need. And this party should be able to exert a corrective influence on South Africa's trajectory. Um, that probably won't happen in a single step. So in other words, it won't be 2024, the ANC loses, new party wins, uh, reforms come, the economy grows and everybody's happy um, and lives happily ever after. Um, it's more likely that in 2024, the ANC will be just below 50 or just above, and we'll have a very messy period of coalition politics with uh, parties coming together to do things, then breaking apart, then fighting with each other, much like they did in Nelson Mandela Bay and Johannesburg, for example, in those coalition governments. Uh, and that will just make South Africans more frustrated and uh, upset with the state of the politics. But that will even improve the, the, the conditions for a new party to come up and address those frustrated voters. And that is really where we see the, the potential positive future for South Africa. If that doesn't happen, then probably the enclave society is the most likely outcome, which is just that the state becomes uh, incapable of enforcing its authority. It recedes involuntarily. Um, it starts to become uh, to be ignored more and more, and communities stay, take things into their own hands, which is not necessarily a great outcome because uh, it, it means that you, it will be powerful parties that determine the rules in each of those enclaves. 
So instead of having you know a unitary state and the rule of law and, and uh, rules and procedures that arrange society, it will be a much more question of, of might over right. Um, so if you know if people who are powerful, uh, resource uh, rich in resources, influential will do okay, their lives will be fine. But for most South Africans who do not have those resources and who are not powerful, life will become quite unpleasant. Thanks, John. And um, yes, you also answered Dale's question, which I'm sure um, you might also have seen popping there. And uh, Tova also asked a question, which is you did answer more or less, but I think maybe if, if we could just, you know, talk a little bit longer about that. Um, she did ask that if the ANC were to lose, do you think that they would become more violent or would you know, the people believe in this new party that fought for them? Um, so I think the, the, the first point I'd like to make in response there is that we assigned a low probability to the likelihood of a violent overthrow of government. Um, but we think that, we don't, we don't think there were real coup plotters involved in what happened in July. But we think there are people who have the required skills to mount a coup, um, who were trained in East Germany and have the necessary revolutionary credentials, who would have observed what happened in July and been encouraged by it. You know, they, they would have seen the, the lack of uh, response from the state and maybe thought that they could do something along the lines of a coup or proper insurrection. So we now assign a higher likelihood to the risk of a violent um, change in government. I still don't think this is a, you know, about 50% risk, but where previously it might've been a marginal, you know, a two, 3% risk. I think that has now climbed a bit, uh, maybe to, you know, just below 10% or so. Um, then the second question is, will, will the violence reduce if the ANC loses an election? I think that, determined, that depends quite a lot on what uh, replaces it and what policies replace it. I think that the violence would decline very quickly if the economy grew very quickly. And the economy could be made to grow very quickly with some very um, fundamental reforms. Uh, we put forward some, some suggestions on what that should be, um, what those reforms should be. But we think that in the current uh, political environment, they're unpalatable um, to the party in government. Um, despite its declining support, um, it will not be willing to, to entertain these reforms. Uh, we put out a paper last, uh, last year, a growth and recovery strategy for South Africa, and pointed out firstly that the mood at the moment in South Africa economically is, is quite despondent, and that uh, it reflects on investment and on job creation and all sorts of other things. You could turn that mood around if you had the right policies. You can't do it through talk shops. So investment conferences are a nice idea, um, but they're not what, what's going to turn it around because uh, for, for most small businesses, ordinary South Africans, you know, that's something that happens quite far away. And you don't see the impact of that. You know, even if it's billions of rands of investment promised, you don't see it in your life. So that's not going to reduce the violence. You need the economy to grow properly. The second thing, the second point we made is that most of the government's programs aimed at getting the economy to grow are very expensive. So it's infrastructure projects, it's black industrialist projects, it's um, job creation projects, all of which costs very large, vast sums of money, which we don't have. But the reforms which we do need could be done at no cost. Um, it would be a matter of scrapping bad legislation and replacing it with better legislation and being more welcoming to investors. And that is really what will turn the country's fortunes around. Great, thanks, John. Thanks for the insight. Um, then we've got an anonymous question um, that asked you to please look into your crystal ball, John. And I um, was just asking around, you know, with the current economic situation that Africa is in, do you see that there's more highly skilled South Africans that will now leave the country, you know, for opportunities across the border, overseas? I think we'll see a lot of um, semi-migration. Um, so I think the Western Cape is increasingly positioning itself as a counter model to um, ANC governance in the rest of the country. And I think that will have been accelerated by the, the events of July. Um, so I can imagine business owners, um, people who have the means, factory owners, relocating to the Western Cape because they think that they've got a better chance of avoiding a repeat of the events that we saw um, in, in, in after 9th of July in KZN. In terms of emigration, 
I think, I think yes. I think more people are toying with the idea of leaving the country. I do wonder, though, to what extent the ones for whom it was easy to do so have not already done so. So emigrating is expensive. Um, it's fraught with bureaucratic uh, hurdles. Um, uh, getting residency elsewhere isn't, isn't straightforward. That's really a hard, a hard and long process. Um, and lots of South Africans have emigrated, um, the ones who were able to do so. Um, by the way, not just uh, white South Africans, but across all, all racial groups. Um, and yeah, so you might still see an increase in that rate, maybe, um, but not as much as it would be if, if many hadn't left already. And John, just adding on to that, is that, is that a concern? It is a huge concern, yeah. So there, there's a, a very interesting statistic called the uh, economic complexity. And if you, if you Google it, you'll find that there's an atlas of economic complexity, which compares global economies in terms of the diversity of products and services which they produce. And this is uh, an often underreported, but very important characteristic of economies, which is how, how diversified they are. And this is one of the risks in South Africa is that the, the, the complexity of our economy is declining. In other words, you see uh, fewer, a, a smaller range of products available. You see a smaller range of different kinds of work being done in the economy, and that closes down space for job creation and so on. And this is linked to immigration, because often it is the, the business owners, the entrepreneurs, the investors who decide to leave. And these are the people who create many different kinds of, of companies. Um, this is being exacerbated at the moment by um, very bad industrial policy, um, which is protectionist policy, where the uh, Minister of Trade and Industry is trying to pick champions in the South African economy that he protects through uh, import tariffs. So um, some, some parts of the steel industry, for example, are now benefiting from these import tariffs. But the thing is, of course, that these steel products then become more expensive for the local market. And these steel products are inputs for downstream um, businesses. So companies that produce things out of steel are now not able to access the cheap steel from overseas. Companies that make things out of aluminium, like aluminium window frames or extrusions and profiles, will have to pay higher prices. Um, and that is why. So one, one really good example, sadly, of, of bad economic policy, where it, it sounds sensible. You say, we have to protect our local aluminium industry, our local steel industry, because they can't compete with the cheap foreign imports. So they'll put some, some, um, some customs on the imports. But the economy is a complex thing. It's like a living organism. And when you try to sort of shelter one part of it, you weaken other parts of it. And those downstream effects, I think, are not well appreciated. Um, and what we should be promoting is, is this uh, economic ecosystem diversity. And you do that you know, by fertilizing the ecosystem with good policies. Uh, and not by uh, cutting it off from other parts of the world economy, the world economic ecosystem. Thanks, John. I was just about trying to find that not the perfect balance, but at least some form of balance. Um, then we've got a question from Herman. Is the social grant system sustainable? Are we not creating a society that will be forever more dependent on the state, although it is necessary in certain sectors? Yeah. So I, I like the rider you put on there at the end, Herman, um, because there is genuine hardship in South Africa and the social grants do help to alleviate that genuine hardship. The social grants would be sustainable if our jobs had continued growing at the rate that they did in that first decade and a half of democracy. So, you know, you, you need to have lots of people working to fund the people who receive social grants. I think that the social grant lot was probably appropriate and a good thing um, for South Africa, um, you know, a necessary step to alleviate really severe hardship. But it was done without the other side of the equation, which is making sure that you've got the economic growth, you've got the, the job creation, which generates the resources to be able to, to sustain that, that system. Um, we also saw most recently the extension of the 350 grant through to, to March next year at a cost of 27 billion rand. That is being funded out of a tax windfall, mostly on mining profits. But um, it, it's an indication that the government still doesn't have the political will 
to do the things that it needs to do because what it should have done is use the windfall to pay down the debt and 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 open up breathing space fiscal breathing space for the for the government to do other things so now it's sort of spending a once off windfall on a once off um, gratuity effectively on the on the on, on the population um, you can also see this in, co in possible coordination with the postponement of the elections um, but it's it's not it's not a sustainable way of doing things so yes so to to cut a long answer very short um, the social grants are sustainable in a growing economy they are not sustainable in an economy that is stagnant and that doesn't create jobs so thank you, John. And then we've got a question from Duncan, which I think, oh no, we've got another one. I um, thought it might be our last one, but it is not, which is great. We still have a few minutes. So thanks everyone for engaging with us, really enjoying it. So Duncan asked, is there any real evidence of a viable alternative or coalition emerging at present? Um, really hard to say. Um, so, the a let's assume a scenario where the ANC um, is watching the results board in Midrand after an election and sees that it has come in at below 50%. So the next day, the Secretary General or the President will have to pick up the phone and call some other parties to form a, uh, form a coalition. And would the President or the Secretary General call the EFF, which is, I think, sort of something that we speculate about because we think you know the EFF is sort of like a, a child of the ANC and can it be welcomed back like the prodigal son into the fold? Maybe, maybe it will, but maybe it won't. And here's why it might not. The EFF looks at the ANC and sees a party in decline, one that's falling apart, one that's losing its grip. Does it really want to go get into bed with that kind of, of, of an association? Or will it say, you know, that's going to weaken us to be associated with something like that? It's far better for us to stay outside and keep fighting and maintain our identity. And from the ANC's perspective, a similar thing could happen. You know, it looks at the EFF, it looks at itself, it sees that it doesn't really have much intellectual firepower anymore, it doesn't have much strategic clarity anymore. And it looks at the EFF and it sees this very convincing, very clear, very focused, very astute political movement, um, ruthless too. Does it want to invite that back into its own camp? Because I think the ANC leaders know that they would be eaten alive by the EFF because they are just so much clearer and so much more ruthless than what the ANC, anything the ANC has to offer at the moment. So this ANC and EFF coalition, I think is still a risk. And if it happens, it's a very big problem for the country. Um, but there are reasons to think why it might not happen. The ANC might approach the DA possibly um, uh, Stienhausen has been reaching out, I think, across the aisle, uh, not to serve on Cyril Ramaphosa's cabinet, as the SABC reported it, but at least offering to cooperate, and, and that could be helpful. Otherwise, if it comes to political alternatives, I think the cupboard is pretty bare, bare. and the alternative, I think, is st something still to emerge. It is something that we're not seeing on the horizon yet. Herman Mashaba with Action SA, I think, is trying to build the sort of a right of center kind of party that would speak to that political vacuum that exists in that area. But his organization, we feel, is not quite strong enough to, to mount a proper challenge. So it may be that he's the, the, the groundbreaker, the, the pathfinder, who shows the way to, to addressing that grouping. But it may be that it will be a different party that actually takes on the mantle and then may, makes, makes a success of addressing that, that electorate. Um, and then a question around, and maybe this is just also your views on, you know, what's where do you think SA is heading? And I know you've spoken a bit about it, but maybe just a more, you know, you've given speculations, but maybe just, you know, a bit of a gut feel of where, where it's going is just a question around long term investments and permanently investing in, in SA like property. You know, is it, what are your views on that? And do you think it's, it's worthwhile with our current and future economy? I think that. So I think what, what you need to do is prepare yourself for various potential outcomes. Um, you, 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 if you try to forecast or, or predict the future, you're probably going to get it wrong. And so there's this one option where the ANC is defeated and reforms happen and things go right and you should set yourself up for that, be prepared for that to happen. 
There's also the enclave future as another scenario, and you should also prepare yourself for that. So you need to diversify. Diversification is very, interest, uh, very important, and so is preparation. Do I think that South Africa still offers opportunities? Yes, I do think so. Um, I think in niche markets, there are still very good profits to be made. Um, my personal risk profile would lead me to not put down too much money into um, fixed capital in South Africa. Um, so I think what I would do is, is leverage my investments, um, rather do that um, and, and, and try to diversify some of your assets offshore to protect them. Um, I would definitely not keep all of my eggs in one basket. Um, so certainly diversify the risk. Thanks, John. And I think once again, it's also to do that balance because if we don't invest in asset, it also you know, makes a difference to our economy. And yeah, so yeah. it's a bit of and a sad reality. That's true. But of course, credit is cheap at the moment. Um, and you, you, know, you, you can invest with borrowed money. Um, mm -hmm. And that, 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 yeah, I think that, that's what I would do. Great, thanks. I'm going to take two more questions. Um, there's a lot of thank yous and great sessions. So John, thank you very, very much. We do, we do appreciate your time, your team's time. Um, let me just find one here. Sorry, I've got a whole lot going up here now. Um, we had one from Elsie. So in your opinion, in particular in the unrest in KZN and Gauteng, do you have any thoughts on how this will affect our insurance industry? I know this isn't something maybe that you guys specialize in and we've got some thoughts on that, but you know, what is just, you know, because our insurance industry does kind of keep our economy going to a certain extent, so. Yeah, I think I would like to attend a briefing where you answer that question because you're probably in a better position to do that than I am. Um, I would like to make one, one quick comment maybe on Sasaria because that I think is the insurance company that really is taking the, the biggest direct knock from the damage that occurred um, in July. Um, Sasria was pretty well capitalized, um, but probably not well enough capitalized to cover the losses that, that arose, which means that it has to go back to the national treasury to ask for money, which I think it has been granted. So it has been given some, given some additional capitalization to uh, cover those losses. But after paying out, I think there will not be much capital left in Sasria. And I also don't think that a repeat of the July unrest is impossible. As a matter of fact, I think it's it's likely. You know, we've seen this sort of simmering level of protests happening all the time on an ongoing basis. Just you know, between eight and ten per day if you if you break it down across the year. And July was you know it was like a COVID spike. You know, so you get this sort of going along at a certain level, simmering along, and then you get a, a breakout, a wave, and then it comes down again. But I don't think this was the only wave. I think there will be other waves. And Sasrio is going to face future claims, I think, because of, of unrest and riots. Um, and I'm not actually sure what their, what their reinsurance situation is, if they just use the state as a backstop or if they've also got reinsurance for their own risks. So yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't have more technical knowledge than that. You have to get them. Uh, I choose to have Sergio online and have them answer all these questions. But we'll invite you on, John. You can That'd be cool. <laughs> yes. Come see what they say. Um, John, just I'm just going to do one quick last one. I think it's one that we all need to be so aware of. And I saw an article from on ESCOM saying that they're going to start looking at you know kitchen coal over the long term. I think we've seen the world going more and more green and economies being forced into it. So uh, just a question from Chris. So do you see the growth of the green economy? as one of the key catalysts to economic growth in this area? At the moment, I think it's more of a risk than an opportunity um, in the sense that we're still very dependent on coal and um, sort of the ESG investment uh, philosophy in the Western world makes accessing funding for coal technology, for example, much more difficult. Um, I know that ESCOM management is in, in, in the right mental space, they are thinking about the, the green energy transition. But there might be some opportunities there if industrial policy doesn't get in the way. Um, and you know, here the idea is that you want, might want to produce solar panels in South Africa, but for that you need aluminium um, and the aluminium is becoming expensive because they're protecting local industry. And so the local solar panel manufacturers can't produce the modules at a reasonable cost because the aluminium is too expensive. Um, you're going to see that that sort of thing happening. Um, so there is potential there to you know 
make something of it, I think, for South Africa. But we need to get the policy right. Otherwise, we're shooting ourselves in the foot and we're sort of going to fall over our own feet, trying to use these opportunities and just not doing it very well. Um, and that is, uh, it's a reflection on inter interventionism. So our government believes that the state has the duty to make things work and to intervene and, you know, sort out the economy, sort out the poverty, sort out the unemployment. But the more they intervene, the worse things get. And then they say, well, this is terrible. The unemployment has gone up. Our economy is going even worse. So we must intervene more. We have to fix this. Um, and that doesn't work. And at some stage, the realization will have to come and say, you know, economies actually work better if you set the rules and you provide mechanisms for enforcing the rules through rule of law, um, contracts, court system, etc. But you don't get so involved in the details of managing the economy because you cannot anticipate the secondary effects of what you're doing. And those are often those unintended effects are often what bites you in the end. Um, and so, you know, un until that fundamental mindset shift takes place, I see a lot of stumbling and fumbling in our future.